All right, a couple of reminders as I get started. I've talked enough about these, so I don't need to elaborate, but there will be no office hours today, and the exam review for midterm one is going to be tomorrow on Microsoft Teams uh, sometime in the afternoon. I guess uh, I said I'll let you know exactly when it's going to start as soon as I can know that. Um, and then also today's lecture is going to be a little bit on the short side. That's not because I totally forgot how to plan a one-hour and 20-minute lecture. It's on purpose because we are... A little bit ahead and I need to get back for meetings that I'm skipping out on right now to teach this stuff. So what we're going to do today is talk about a, a concept called hybridization. Um, so we have discussed recently how covalent bonds or what covalent bonds are, the sharing of electrons between two atoms, and then how those covalent bonds can form larger and more complex molecules, and now we can predict the shapes of those molecules as we talked about most recently. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to lie to you for an hour about how exactly those bonds are formed. Um, hybridization doesn't actually happen as it turns out, um, but it's one of those convenient models for bonding that's relatively simple and intuitive and so it gives us some useful information. So it's kind of like the Bohr model that we learned a long time ago. It's not a physically accurate model, but it still does tell us some things that are useful and makes some useful predictions from it. Um, there is a definition of model that I've heard before, which is um, a model is a, is a lie that we tell to understand the truth, and so that's kind of what we're doing today. We're kind of giving you a, a picture of bonding that's not really physically accurate, but still helps us understand some things and make some predictions about molecules. Now what we'll start with first is some very simple diatomic molecules. And so how exactly are, you know, we say that electrons are shared in a covalent bond. Well, how exactly does that work? You know, wh wh where are the electrons? How exactly are they shared? And, and so on. So. Basically what this bonding model we're going to cover today assumes is that you have localized orbitals on each atom. So if you have two atoms in a bond, you have orbitals on each atom that are localized, and then those two orbitals will overlap. And then the, the electrons that are shared are going to be in that region where the two orbitals overlap with each other. So if we had H2 hydrogen, we learned a long time ago that the ground state of hydrogen has a single electron in a 1s orbital. So if you have one hydrogen atom that has a 1s orbital and you combine it with the second hydrogen atom that has the same 1s orbital with a single electron in it, so hydrogen is 1s1, that's its electron configuration. And so then what you do is when you combine these two to make H2, these two 1s orbitals, still two individual atomic orbitals on each hydrogen, but they're going to overlap with each other. And so it kind of looks like this. You have one 1s orbital that has a spherical shape, as you recall. The second 1s orbital is going to overlap with that. And the two electrons are going to be shared in the middle. So if you're trying to keep track of where the nuclei are, they're right at the center of each of these. So you have like a nucleus there and a nucleus there. And in between the two nuclei is where those two orbitals, the atomic orbitals, overlap. And where that region of overlap occurs, that's how the two electrons are shared. So that's a simple way of describing bonding in something like H2. And again, the key picture, the key distinction of what we're doing today, this is called the um, valence bond theory that we're talking about today. So there's going to be two bonding theories we cover. And this one's called valence bond theory, or localized bonding approach, as it's sometimes called. And the key idea is that you still have localized atomic orbitals, one on each atom that's in the bond, and it's those two individual orbitals that are overlapping and shared, with, and, then, and, and that's where the electrons are shared. Um, and the electrons are localized in that shared region. So this is kind of the key things here. So for hydrogen, this is how it works. Now if we go to other diatomic molecules like Cl2, when electrons overlap to form bonds, we've kind of already talked about this in the context of Lewis structures, it's going to be the valence electrons that are involved. So when we're, when we're trying to think about how are these two atoms going to form a bond with each other, we have to understand what their valence electrons are first. So for Cl2, if we look at each individual chlorine atom and, and find the electron configuration, chlorine is here in group 7, so it's going to have a neon core, and then it's going to be 3s2, 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's the all the valence electrons available in chlorine are going to be 3s2 and 3p5, neon core with 3s2 and 3p5 valence electrons. Now when you have covalent bonds being formed, what you need are you need unpaired electrons, one in each atom, that then come together and pair up to form that overlap region and form that, that covalent bond. So in, in chlorine, you have filled 3s orbitals, 
is 3s2, so you don't have any unpaired electrons in 3s. So what we're going to use is an unpaired 3p electron. There's going to be one unpaired electron in the 3p orbitals. If you drew them out and followed Hund's rule, there'd just be one that's unpaired. And so because that's where the unpaired electrons are, those are the orbitals that are going to overlap. So if you recall the shape of a p orbital, it's more like this figure eight shape. So on one chlorine atom, you're going to have a figure eight where in reality the electron is delocalized over that whole orbital. And then you have a second one, and if we line them up in such a way, and so the other thing, thing I'm showing here that's sort of important is, remember that for p orbitals you have two different phases that are shown with different colors here. So the, the unshaded one represents, for example, the positive area of the wave function, the blue is the negative, or vice versa, however you sign it. And so those uh, lobes or those phases that are alike are gonna line up with each other, and you have the like this, and then they're gonna to come together and overlap, just like we did for s orbitals, but now just a little more complicated because it's p. So those like phases, the ones that are both shaded the same, are gonna overlap here in the middle. This is not as easy to draw, but I'll get it eventually. So they're gonna overlap here in the middle. I didn't quite draw them the same size, but it's close enough. And then you have those two like phases overlapped, and the two electrons are gonna be in that overlap region when you form the bond. All right, and again, if you want to keep track of where the nuclei are, they're right here at the center of each p orbital, and the shared electrons are in between the two, like that. Okay, so again, that's just an example of two different atomic orbitals, this time 3p, can also overlap to form a covalent bond. And then finally, if we have HCl, two different atoms with two different types of valence orbitals, if we have hydrogen and chlorine, where hydrogen, as we said, is 1s1, chlorine has 3s2, 3p5 valence electrons, and so in this case, what you're gonna do is you're gonna use two different orbitals to overlap. A 1s orbital from hydrogen, where its valence electron is, and then a 3p orbital from chlorine, where its valence electron, unpaired valence electron would be. So you have your hydrogen, 1s, you have your chlorine, 3p, and those two can come together to make HCl, where you're gonna have the s orbital on hydrogen overlapping with the p orbital on chlorine. All right, so you need this sort of head-to-head -head arrangement of the two orbitals. I didn't leave a huge overlap region, but the two unpaired electrons would be in there. Try to fix that a little bit. Didn't do a much better job, but anyway, two unpaired electrons right in there where they overlap. And so that's your hydrogen. And that's your chlorine, again, nucleus at the center of each. So electrons share between the two nuclei, which is responsible then for holding those together in a bond. So that's kind of be a simplified picture about how, you know, some elements can, can form bonds with each other, especially if it's just a diatomic molecule like these, where it's just two overlapping orbitals. This simple picture works fine. Again, it's not really physically realistic, but it helps us understand a little bit about how those bonds are formed. But the more complicated situations are gonna be when we have a central atom with more than one outer atom. Um, so how do we do this? So if we think about a linear molecule, for example, beryllium chloride, BeCl2, would, we would use a Lewis structure to, to, write, to draw it out, and then we predict from VSEPR that it's linear. You know, how exactly does that work? Because, you know, the, the beryllium here, the central atom has, you know, 1s2, or sorry, 2s2 configuration. Sorry, uh, it should be 1s. So anyway, for beryllium, if we have the central atom here, we think about its valence electrons. You have Beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, and so its valence orbitals are gonna be 2s, and there's empty 2p's as well. But basically, in beryllium, you have two unpaired electrons in, the, or sorry, two paired electrons in the 2s orbital. So how would those overlap to form bonds? You can't put three electrons in an orbital, so even if this 2s orbital overlaps with something, what's, you know, how's there gonna be a bond? There's no more electrons you can put in there, and how does it end up being linear, right? Because it's just a spherical orbital, so how does that explain how the two bonds end up exactly 180 degrees apart from each other if it's involving this spherical orbital? So what actually happens is a process called hybridization. Now, I'm gonna give you some background in these slides about you know, how exactly hybridization looks and how the energies of the orbitals change, 
The main important thing for you guys to be able to do is just to predict what the hybridization is. But we are going to co cover a little bit about it, so hopefully you can understand it as well. So when you have a linear geometry like BECL2, the way that you can form that linear geometry is you take a 2s orbital and one of the 2p orbitals. So we need to have two electron groups that are 180 degrees apart. So we're going to take two orbitals and we're going to hybridize them together. Hybridize kind of means like mixing. And so what we're going to form then, we, we take one, our 2s orbital and one of our 2p orbitals and we mix them together to form two new hybrid orbitals. So what you'll notice, they're sort of shown here in purple because they're in between the red and the blue extreme. So we've, we've made two mixed orbitals that are called sp hybrids and they have an energy that's sort of in between the 2s and the 2p atomic orbitals that mix together. So again, what we're doing is mixing together two orbitals and making two new orbitals that are called sp. And these sp orbitals now, because they're at the same energy, the two valence electrons go one in each to follow Hund's rule. And now you have those two valence electrons that are unpaired, 180 degrees apart, and they can then overlap with other atoms like chlorine to form those bonds and make that linear molecule. And what you still have, because we've only used one of the three 2p orbitals, you still have two unhybridized 2p orbitals as well that are, that are unchanged. Sorry, this is 1p. I keep, yeah, it is 2p, sorry. It's 2s and 2p. The energy of these is going to be unchanged because those are unhybridized. And in this molecule, because you only have two bonds being formed, these would be completely empty. So sometimes you'll have empty... 2p orbitals, or as we'll see later on, these 2p orbitals can also be involved in forming bonds, but it's not a type that we would see just yet. So this is our first example of hybridization. If you have a linear molecule with two electron groups, you're going to take a 2s orbital and one 2p orbital, mix them together to form two new valence sp hybrids, and those are going to be the ones that are involved in forming the bonds. Um, now in terms of you know the shapes of the sp orbitals, what they basically look like is you have your nucleus here and then each 2p each sp hybrid is kind of like a mixture between an s and a p so it has like a big lobe and a small lobe and so that's an individual sp hybrid then you have the second one that's 180 degrees apart from that so these sort of two individual sp hybrids are going to be 180 degrees apart and then they're going to overlap with the chlorine on either side using its valence orbitals to form the linear molecule so we don't concern ourselves too much with the shapes basically the shapes of a hybrid orbital do not mean to do that, are kind of like this. And they form the, um, a set of them that gives you the proper geometry for that electron group arrangement. Now if we go to sp2 hybridization, this is the next one. This is the hybridization that's going to be correlated with the trigonal planar geometry, which as we said uh, last time is three electron groups. So if you have ax3, for example, or any combination of three electron groups that has a trigonal planar arrangement, you would need to do sp2 hybridization. And I think this one hopefully makes even more sense about why we need it, because if we have an example like BF3, boron has a 2s2, 2p1 valence configuration. So the boron atom by itself, it only has you know, one unpaired electron, yet it's forming three bonds with fluorine. So again, that doesn't quite make sense based on the localized picture we talked about earlier. And on top of that, even if we were to put all three of the electrons up here in the 2p orbitals and then start overlapping them, remember that the 2p orbitals are px, py, and pz. They're mutually 90 degrees apart from each other, but the bond angles for this are 120 degrees. So even if we were using all of the p orbitals to make these three bonds, the bond angles wouldn't be correct. They would be 90 degrees instead of 120. So again, clearly something else is going on here to explain how we're able to form three bonds and get them all 120 degrees apart from each other. We can't just use pure atomic orbitals to do that because the 2s orbital is spherical, the 2p orbitals are 90 degrees apart. To get 120 degree bond angle, something else has to happen. So again, what we do is if we want to have three electron groups around our center atom, like we do here, three fluorines in this case, we're going to take three of these orbitals and hybridize them. So we're going to do hybridization again, and this time it's going to involve three total orbitals. So it's going to always involve the 2s, and then it's going to involve two of the 2p orbitals. All right, and so what that leads to is a set of hybrid orbitals, mixed orbitals that are going to be called sp2 because they came from one s orbital and two p orbitals that mixed together to form this set of three.
And now when we do this, because we have three valence electrons on boron, they all three go into individual orbitals like this, and this allows us to form three bonds. Okay, so these will overlap then with other orbitals from fluorine, the, the, probably the 2p orbitals, the valence orbitals from fluorine, and form those three bonds. That allows us to have the three unpaired electrons that we need to form three bonds. Moreover, these are the set of sp2 hybrid orbitals is exactly 120 degrees apart, as we would predict from the geometry. And we still have an unhybridized 2p orbital up there. We've only used two of our three, so that one doesn't go away, but it's going to be empty in this case and not involved in the bonding. It's only going to be these hybrid orbitals that are involved in forming the bonds. All right, and then the last one that I'll go through in some detail is going to be sp3. So for sp3, this is going to correlate with the tetrahedral electron group arrangement or geometry. An example of this is CH4, which is methane. So if we think about the valence electron configuration of carbon, it has a filled 2s orbital, and then it has two electrons in 2p. And so once again, if we just have the atomic orbitals only available to us, it's kind of hard to rationalize that we're going to form four bonds and that the bond angles are going to be 109.5 degrees because you have only two unpaired electrons, and so we can't make four bonds with only two unpaired electrons. And on top of that, these two unpaired electrons are 90 degrees apart because they're in two different p orbitals that have 90 degree uh, relationship, px, py, and pz are all 90 degrees from each other. So we once again have to invoke a mixing of s and p orbitals to be able to form hybrid orbitals that have the proper orientation and then the ability to form all four of those bonds. So when we hybridize in this case, we want to have four electron groups around the central atoms, so we need to hybridize four orbitals. So this time we're going to use all four of them. The 2s orbital plus all three of the 2p orbitals are going to hybridize together, and that leaves us with a set of sp3 hybrid orbitals. All right, so sp3 hybrid orbitals are, are what formed. We use all four of our orbitals so we don't have any more 2p orbitals left over. We've used all four of them to make these hybrids. And now each of these has a single unpaired electron in it. Four valence electrons from carbon. They all arrange themselves in these four hybrid orbitals. And so now we have four orbitals, all at equal energy, and then all able to overlap with hydrogen atomic orbitals to make the tetrahedral arrangement in CH4. All right, and so that's, again, those last three slides kind of give us a picture of how hybridization happens. We take atomic orbitals, we mix them together, and we form new orbitals that are kind of in between in terms of their energy and in terms of what they look like. Um, and so any questions on sort of that background for hybridization? Yeah. Uh, so hybridization is only happening on one atom? Uh, not necessarily, but we're, we're mainly going to focus on the central atom from the, for the protective hybridization. So we're talking right now about the hybridization of the central atom. In more complex structures especially, you would need to also invoke hybridization of other atoms in the structure to account for the number of bonds that they have. Um, but typically for like an AX whatever structure with just a single central atom and outer atoms, you only talk about the hybridization of the central atom primarily. But the other ones could be involved, could, could hybridize as well. All right, but the, the important part for you guys, whether you followed at all what I just talked about or not, um, hopefully a little bit, but maybe not completely, is just being able to predict what the hybridization is. So the vast majority of the problems in this part of the course that deal with hybridization are going to give you a molecule and ask you what is the hybridization of the central atom, and that's what you guys have to be able to do. And this is actually fairly simple to do if we can draw a reasonably good Lewis structure like we had to do already for some of the other things we've talked about. So predicting hybridization is all about the steric number. Remember, steric number is just the total number of electron groups. And so what you do basically is um, you have these different available atomic orbitals that you can hybridize. We've already talked about S up to sp3 where you use the s and the p orbitals. You can also in the hybridization world, you can involve d orbitals as well for those elements that are further down in the periodic table in the third row where the 3d orbitals would be available. This is where the lie gets even more severe. The involvement of d orbitals and bonding in these kinds of molecules is not really true. But it's, again, still a way to rationalize what's happening a little bit. So we'll still, we'll still use those terminology here. Um, but all it really comes down to is you need to know the steric number of the molecule, how many electron groups are on the central atom, and that's how many orbitals you have to hybridize 
in that structure. So if we have a steric number of two, two electron groups, we need to hybridize two orbitals. So we take the first two, which are S and P, and that makes the hybridization SP, and that correlates with the same geometry or electron group arrangement that we already talked about, which is linear for when you have two electron groups. If we have three electron groups around the, on the central atom, like we did for the BF3 example earlier, we now need to hybridize three orbitals. So we go SPP -P for a total of three orbitals hybridized, which we then write as SP2. And this corresponds to the trigonal planar electron group arrangement. Steric number four was the last one we did. And then you would have four orbitals hybridized. So one, two, three, four it means you take the S orbital and all three of the P orbitals to make it SP3. And that corresponds to your tetrahedral arrangement. Now we can go higher than this. When we did VSEPR, we talked about geometries that had either five or six electron groups as well. So we can invoke hybridization for that. Remember, in order to go to five or six electron groups, you have to expand the octet, which means you're always going to be a central atom that's in the third row of the periodic table or below to allow that to happen. And when that's the case, you can also, even though it's a bit of a lie, you can also invoke the involvement of d orbitals in the hybridization. So if we have five electron groups around our central atom, we need to hybridize five orbitals. Well, we only have four total orbitals between S and P, so we need to involve the d orbitals as well. So we're going to hybridize these first five orbitals here if we have five electron groups. And that gives us a hybridization that's going to be called sp3d. Or sometimes dsp3. Don't worry about the order of those. It's the same thing. Um, but sp3d or dsp3, and this corresponds to the trigonal bipyramidal. And again, these last two with five or six electron groups, these are the biggest lies that I'll tell you today. But we still use this terminology to help us understand them a little bit. And then finally, for six electron groups, you need six orbitals hybridized. So we're going to take S, all three, P or, all three P orbitals, and then two D orbitals for a total of six. So that's six orbitals hybridized, which comes out to SP3D2 or D2SP3, either order. And that's octahedral arrangement. So we never use more than two of the D orbitals, even though there's five of them available. In any, in any you know, d orbital set, we're only going to use up to two of them to make sp3d2. That's as high as we'll go. As we said, six electron groups is as high as we'll go for any of these geometries. So if you're able to predict the electron group arrangement with the correct number of electron groups around the center atom, and again, an electron group is either an atom that's bonded to the center atom or a lone pair. So lone pairs still count as an electron group in this argument. And if you, if you have lone pairs, they will be in one of your hybrid orbitals in addition to the, the bonds that are involved as well. So you have to count up all the electron groups to be able to do that. So we'll have examples of this later on that you can see how this works. All right, so let's go right into it. So let's predict the hybridization of the central atom in COCl2. So just like the VSCPR approach, um, you... For, for this, for hybridization, you need to have a reasonably good Lewis structure. It doesn't have to be perfect, because again, all that really matters is the number of electron groups around the center atom. If you don't perfectly minimize formal charges, or if you don't you know, have all the correct number of double bonds and things, you're usually going to be okay. But you still need to have a reasonably good Lewis structure for this. So let's, let's draw this one out. I think we talked about this one a little bit last time, but not in very much detail. So in this one, we have COCl2. Carbon is the center atom, as I've said here, to, to avoid ambiguity. And so we want to know what the hybridization of the carbon is in this case. So we have to count valence electrons first to be able to draw the Lewis structure. So we have carbon, oxygen, and chlorine in this. So we have a group four carbons, that's four valence electrons. Group six oxygen, so that provides six. And then two group seven chlorines, each providing seven valence electrons. So that's how we'll add up valence electrons. That should be something we're fairly proficient at now. So we have four valence electrons on carbon. We have two, sorry, just one oxygen in this formula, which has six valence electrons. We have two chlorines that each provide seven. And so our total is 10 plus 14, which is 24 valence electrons. So this is gonna be a structure that has 24 valence electrons. And so when we draw the structure, we put carbon at the center. We start with single bonds. Complete the octets of the outer atoms. So even though there's two different outer atoms, we're still going to follow that same approach of completing their octets first. When we get to this stage, we've completed three octets. So three times eight is 24. We don't have any more lone pairs for the center atom. 
As we said last time, carbon rarely has lone pairs. Um, this is clearly not the best Lewis structure because it has only six electrons on the central atom. Carbon should have an octet. So we do need a double bond to draw a correct Lewis structure. But whether you have the double bond or not, you would still predict the correct geometry and the correct hybridization. The double bonds don't really matter for that. Um, so this structure comes out to AX3. There's three electron groups around the central atom. All of them are bonded atoms, no lone pairs. You could also call this AX X prime two because they're really two different types of outer atoms. But the important thing is that there's three electron groups or a steric number of three. For carbon, the available orbitals for hybridization are an S orbital and three P orbitals. We never use the D orbitals for carbon because so it's in the second row of the periodic table. But with a steric number of three, we need to hybridize three of those. So we're going to take an S in the first two P orbitals, making this SP2 hybridization. So the Lewis structure I'm hope, hoping you're seeing is fairly powerful because if you draw a good Lewis structure, at least a reasonably good one, you can predict the molecular geometry. That's what we learned earlier. That relates to the polarity of the molecule also. And then now we take it one step further, we can predict the hybridization of the central atom, which tells us how those orbitals mix together and how they would form bonds with the outer atoms. All right, so any questions on this one? So that's a pretty typical type of homework question where you'll just have to predict hybridization. Now, sometimes they get a little bit more complicated. So you're going to start seeing questions on the homework like this, where we give you this sort of long, huge organic molecule with a bunch of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sometimes nitrogen in it. And we're going to ask you to predict the hybridization of not likely all of them in a homework question, but of one or more of the carbon atoms in the structure or other atoms as well. So this one asks us to complete the Lewis structure and predict the hybridization. So we have to sort of, sort of do two parts to this. So we haven't seen one like this yet, so let's cover how we, would, how we would approach this. If we wanted to finish the Lewis structure of this molecule, of course we could you know, total up all the valence electrons, figure out how to complete the octets, and you know, distribute the lone pairs, all that stuff. It's kind of tedious because there's a lot of atoms in the structure. So what's going to help us for problems like this is to recognize some patterns, and as you guys you know, if you progress into organic chemistry, these patterns will be used all the time. So if you have these organic molecules, they're typically going to involve some combination of carbon. Let's start with hydrogen because that's the easy one. They're going to have a hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then sometimes they'll have, I don't think very often, but they'll have a halogen, which I'll call X here. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, so on. as one of the outer atoms, but mostly it's going to be these four elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, okay? So you're going to find these types of atoms in the structure. And what we want to be able to do is we want to complete the octet, we will follow the octet rule, and we're going to minimize formal charges. And if we follow these patterns, we can do that very quickly. So we've already talked about hydrogen. This should only just have one bond and nothing else. So when we draw these skeleton structures that have you know, individual bonds drawn between each atom, we don't have to do anything else to hydrogen. It's never going to have a double bond, it's never going to have a lone pair, so hydrogen you can just basically ignore. But for the rest of these, we have patterns that we're going to follow to get to the octet and to minimize formal charges. So for carbon, we typically will have four bonds and zero lone pairs. So that's a complete octet, but it's all of them are going to be in the form of bonds, no lone pairs. For nitrogen, it's going to be three and one. Typically, you're going to have three bonds and one lone pair. So a total of eight electrons still, but this time six from the bonds, two from a lone pair. This, again, is to minimize formal charge. And then for oxygen, it's going to be two of each. So as you move across the periodic table, you have fewer bonds and more lone pairs. So it's going to be two of each. Two bonds and two lone pairs, total of eight, but that's the pattern we'll follow for oxygen. And then finally, if we have a halogen in the structure, those are typically going to be outer atoms in the structure, not the central atoms. If they're the outer atom, they're going to do one in three. So the pattern continues as we go to group seven, one bond and three lone pairs. Although those don't come up as often. But these four in particular will show up all the time. So in this structure here, we don't do anything to hydrogen. They all have a single bond already. But we have to figure out how to make sure that each carbon has four bonds. Each nitrogen has three bonds and a lone pair. There are no nitrogens. But then the oxygen that's in there should have two of each. So let's go through and do that. So if we come to this first carbon here, we're going to sort of usually just progress left to right or right to left, however you prefer. But this first carbon here already has four bonds. 
hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen to the carbon next to it. So it, we don't do anything else to that carbon. It already has a complete octet. It already has four bonds. So that one's going to be left alone. But when we come to this carbon here, we see that it has only three bonds. And similarly, this carbon here only has three bonds. Does so anybody have an idea of how we can fix that? Yes, so we're going to draw a double bond between these two carbon atoms here to make sure that they each have four bonds. We can't have the double bond go in the other direction because that would make five bonds on this carbon. Um, and if you have more than four bonds to a carbon, we call that a Texas carbon um, because everything's bigger in Texas, but it's not scientifically correct. So you don't want to draw five bonds to carbon, even though it sounds cool to do so. Um, so we have to make sure that we put the double bond there so that each carbon has exactly four bonds, but not more than that. So now these two carbons are happy. We get to this one here, it already has four bonds. Carbon, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, total of four. So that one doesn't have anything else. But then once again, we get to this carbon here. It only has three bonds. And this is where there's, we have a little bit of a choice to make. Where should we put the double bond? Should we put it to here or to here? Well, we also have an oxygen here. Oxygen wants to have two bonds and two lone pairs. So the only way that we can fix that is to make this a double bond. That gives the oxygen two bonds, which is what it's looking for. It gives this carbon four. Oxygen also needs to have the two lone pairs, so we can draw those in now as well. And so that takes care of the octet for this carbon and for the oxygen that's bonded to following this pattern over here. Finally, we get to this carbon. This only has two bonds. We can't draw any more bonds to that carbon because it already has four, but then it's, it's also next to another carbon that has two bonds. So these two both have two bonds. The only way to get them up to four is to draw two more and make it a triple bond. All right, so that gives each carbon four bonds. So that's kind of the way you'll sort of piece together the puzzle of making sure that every atom has the correct number of um, double bonds, triple bonds, and, and a total of eight valence electrons around it. All right, so any questions on up to that point? Now, it turns out to answer the question about hybridization, you didn't really need to do that, as it turns out because all that matters for hybridization is the number of electron groups, not whether they're singly, doubly, or triply bonded, but that's an exercise first to complete the Lewis structure, but now we can go and do the hybridization of each carbon atom. So if we look at this one here, the first one, remember that the hybridization correlates with how many electron groups are around that carbon atom. So this, four, this first carbon atom has four electron groups, one, two, three, four bonds, all three to hydrogen, one to carbon. So with four electron groups, that correlates with sp3 hybridization. You need to hybridize all four orbitals. These two here, I should draw the, orbital, the arrows in the same direction. So these two there, what you have in this case is one, two, three electron groups. It's bonded to a carbon, it's bonded to a hydrogen, it's bonded to another carbon. Total of three electron groups. Doesn't matter if this one's double bonded, so it counts as one electron group. So with three electron groups, you get sp2, and the carbon next to it also has three. One, two, three things that it's bonded to, which is sp2. This carbon here in the towards the middle has, again, four bonds. So with four things bonded to it, four electron groups, that's sp3. We hybridize four of those orbitals. The carbon next to it here, we have one, two, three things bonded to it, so that makes it sp2. We hybridize three orbitals. And then finally, for these last two here, this carbon is only bonded to two things. It's singly bonded to one carbon, triply bonded to another, so only two electron groups around that makes it sp, with only two electron groups. And then same for this one. It's triply bonded to a carbon, that's one electron group. Singly bonded to a hydrogen, that's the second. Two electron groups gives us sp hybridization. So when you have these larger structures like that, we typically wouldn't ask you to do all of them in a single homework question, but if we ask you to identify specific carbon atoms in the structure and predict their hybridization, it's based entirely on how many electron groups surround that particular carbon, and, and it correlates directly then with the hybridization. All right, so any questions on that one? You'll have to get used to that type of question. We haven't seen it yet, but it'll, you'll, you'll get to practice it on the upcoming assignments, and um, it'll, it'll become easier. All right, now the other little layer of this that we need to cover is the different types of bonds that can form. So we've talked about, okay, the formation of hybrid orbitals on the central atom. They can overlap with, um, you know, orbitals from the outer atoms, but there's actually, it turns out there's two different types of bonds that can, that can form in these types of Lewis structures. So the first, which we've kind of already sketched out a little bit, are called sigma bonds. This is the most common one, I would say. And so these are going to be bonds that are formed by end-to-end -end overlap of atomic or hybrid orbitals. 
So in those pictures that we drew like at the very beginning of today where we showed two atomic orbitals coming together, overlapping in the middle, the electrons are right between the two nuclei, that's considered a sigma bond. That's the, the name of that. So that's just a more formal definition of what we've already showed, which is end-to-end -end overlap of atomic orbitals or hybrid orbitals. It could be either. And another sort of definition of this is that if you think about where the electron density is in this bond, the shared electron density between the two atoms, it's going to be the, the highest or the greatest in between the nuclei along the bond axis. And so what that means, those of you that are here with me in person can see the, the gyrations I'm about to do. If you have two orbitals that are pointing right at each other and they overlap head to head like this, that would be a sigma bond. One orbital comes from this way, one orbital comes from this way, they overlap right in the middle, the electron density is right between the two atoms, that's called a sigma bond. Now the other thing we want to appreciate is what types of orbitals would be involved in this. So these can form with atomic and or hybrid orbitals. So either one can be involved. But a key distinction here is that if we have hybrid orbitals, so if we predict that the center atom is hybridized, as we just learned how to do, those hybrid orbitals will only form sigma bonds. That's the only type of bonds that hybrid orbitals can form. So we're going to talk about two different bond types. And if you have a if you have hybrid orbitals, the only type of bond they can be involved with is a sigma bond. Now, for completeness, I will say that hybrid orbitals can also hold lone pairs, but that's not a bond. That's another role that they can play. But in terms of the bond types, we're going to talk about sigma right now, and then also there's pi. We'll get to in a little bit. If you have a hybrid orbital, they can only form sigma bonds. All right. So this is a very similar picture that we you know, drew before, but let's do a, little, a slightly more complicated one. So if we have boron, if we have BH3, let's say, boron is going to be sp2 hybridized. It has three electron groups around the center atom. So the sp2 orbitals, each of those is going to arrange themselves in a trigonal planar arrangement. And they're sort of the second lobe here, but we're not going to really draw that. So you have three sp2 orbitals on boron. And then those are going to overlap on hydrogen with its 1s orbitals. So you'll get overlap in each of those directions with hydrogen 1s orbitals. So that's hydrogen, 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 and then two shared electrons in between each of those. So that's an example of a sigma bond, a hybrid orbital coming together with an atomic orbital or two atomic orbitals, but they always come together sort of head to head and that have that shared electron density right between them. So that's called a sigma bond. The other type is called a pi bond. So we're learning more Greek letters today that we haven't seen yet in this course, although you've probably all seen pi before in your math courses. So what a pi bond involves is side to side overlap of orbitals. And so what that results in is gonna be regions of electron density that are above and below the bond axis. All right, so when we say side to side, the only types of orbitals that can do this for the types of molecules that we'll talk about in this class are going to be unhybridized p orbitals. So s orbitals cannot form pi bonds or hybrid orbitals, as we talked about, cannot form pi bonds. Only unhybridized p orbitals are need, can, can be involved in the formation of pi bonds. So the way that it works is if this is your bond there between the two nuclei, that's the direction of the bond axis, you're going to take two p orbitals that are perpendicular to that bond. So for example, in this arrangement here, so p orbitals have this 
dumbbell or figure eight shape. So that's two separate P orbitals. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna overlap above and below the bond axis. So you'll have the like phases are gonna be lined up and you're gonna have overlap regions above and below like that. So that would be the direction of the pi bond. So it's sort of, again, two side to side orbitals coming together and overlapping above and below where the bond is. All right, so that's what a pi bond looks like. And it always involves unhybridized p orbitals that are going to be perpendicular to the direction of the bond. All right, and again, it's helpful to understand the orbitals that are involved and sort of be able to picture them. But the real, the real point of this and what you're going to likely mostly have to do on homework assignments and test questions is you're going to use this localized bonding approach, valence bond theory, which is what we've all been discussing today, hybridization is in, involved with that, and you're going to just be able to predict how many sigma bonds are there in the molecule, how many pi bonds are there. And so for that, there's some relatively straightforward patterns that you need to be aware of. So the first is that if you have a single bond, you know, most of the bonds that we'll see are single bonds, those are always going to be sigma. When we talk about the more complicated bond theory that we're going to get to next time, although the one that only for us is going to work for very simple molecules because it's so complicated, you will see there are sometimes cases where single bonds are not single bonds. But using the hybridization valence bond theory approach, if you have a single bond, it will be a sigma bond only. Okay. Now if you have multiple bonds, a double bond or a triple bond, we're never going to go higher than that, they're always going to have one sigma bond and the rest will be pi. So a double bond has two total bonds, a triple bond has three, one of those will be a sigma bond and then the rest that are in that are going to be pi bonds. So to state it more specifically, if you have a double bond where you have four shared electrons, two pairs of shared electrons, you're going to have one sigma bond and one pi bond making up that double bond. Sigma bond that goes in between the two, pi bond that goes above and below that bond. So one of each. If you have a triple bond, it's still just a one of those three is a single bond and the other two are both pi. So it's one sigma and two pi. So that's how we would predict how many of each bond there is. It's just going to be whether it's a single bond, exclusively a sigma, or if it's a multiple bond, you'll have one of each. All right, so any questions on that? Now, I guess I do want to give just a little bit of a picture of how this works. It's not as easy to draw, but let's say we have a carbon-oxygen double bond. We saw that in the last example. We're going to see it again here. You know, how do the orbitals look for this one? Well, okay, so what we have in this case is one sigma and one pi bond. Anytime you have a double bond, that's going to be the case. So our sigma bond, I'm going to draw them separately here so it doesn't get too messy. Our sigma bond, let's say it's this molecule here with just two hydrogens there. So our carbon is sp2 hybridized. So our sigma bond is going to have a carbon sp2 orbital overlapping with an oxygen, which is also going to be sp2 because there's three electron groups in oxygen, one bond and two lone pairs. So again, the sigma bonds are going to typically o involve overlap of hybrid orbitals, in this case both sp2. The pi bond that we have, which is going to be above and below the sigma bond, that's going to involve unhybridized p orbitals. So for carbon, that's going to be a 2p, and an oxygen that's also going to be a 2p. So the pi bond will involve two unhybridized pi orbital, or sorry, p orbitals. And so that, what that kind of looks like is, for sigma, you'd have Again, an sp2 hybrid orbital that looks kind of like this with another sp2 hybrid orbital overlapping to form a bond in between them. And then for the pi bond, you're going to have an un a perpendicular 2p orbital. Uh, I didn't give myself enough room. A perpendicular 2p orbital on carbon, another 2p orbital on oxygen and those are going to overlap above and below. So that double bond consists of both of those two bonds at the same time. A sigma bond that holds them together right between, and then a pi bond that goes above and below that sigma bond, basically, using perpendicular p orbitals. So we, we do want to have you know, a little bit of an idea of that level of detail, which will come up in some of the homework questions that you'll see. Um, but the majority of them are going to be, again, kind of like what we did for hybridization, just 
predicting how many of each type of bond there is. So we're going to go back to that same molecule that we drew earlier. So earlier in this lecture, just a few slides ago, we completed the Lewis structure, we predicted the hybridization of each carbon atom, but then another type of question that we could ask about very similar structures, and for this one you would need to make sure that you completed all of the um, you know, double bonds and lone pairs and things, like that. especially the double bonds need to be, and triple, triple bonds need to be there. So you have to know that whether they're single double or triple bonds to be able to answer this, but we're just simply going to ask how many sigma and how many pi bonds are there in this molecule. So as we talked about, if you have a single bond, it's going to be sigma. So let's start with the single bonds and label them all as sigma. So there's that one, that one, that one, and that one. All the hydrogens are single sigma bonds, of course, but there's also some carbon-carbon sigma bonds sort of thrown around in there, sigma, 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 and sigma. So those are all just sigma bonds. And then for the ones that are double or triple bonds, it's going to be one sigma and the rest are pi. So this double bond here is one sigma and the other one's a pi. This double bond, same story, one sigma, the other one's a pi. And then finally we have a triple bond here, which is going to be one sigma bond and then two, two pi bonds when it's triple. All right, so that's a labeling of all the bonds. Now we just have to be able to count to answer the question. So for sigma, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 sigma bonds in the molecule. And how many pi bonds? There's one there, two there, three, four, four pi. So it's pretty common that sigma is more, com you know, more prevalent than pi because every bond has at least one sigma bond, or has exactly one sigma bond, I should say. But if you have multiple bonds in the structure, there will also be pi bonds involved, and so we see a few of those in this one as well. All right, so as I said, today's lecture was deliberately short, shorter than I maybe even anticipated. So do we have any last questions on what we covered today? Yeah. Um, so you don't count the bone pairs? Yeah, lone pairs are not bonds. So you would predict that these lone pairs here, this oxygen has three electron groups. It has a, car a bond to a carbon and two lone pairs. So you would predict that the lone pairs here are in sp2 orbitals, because lone pairs are always in hybrid orbitals if you have hybridization, but they're not involved in the bonds. So there's no sigma or pi component to it. Only when you have an overlap of electrons to form a bond would it be classified as either sigma or pi. Any other questions? All right, so I think we're kind of back on track with where we normally are, so we're not, you know, this short lecture today won't make us fall behind. You have the exam starting Monday, so that's your, of course, primary concern, and hopefully I'll see some of you online tomorrow for the review. Thank you.